RAF B-24 Liberator transport plane prepares to take off from the British Overseas Territory of Gibraltar. Among those on board is Władysław Sikorski, the Polish Prime Minister and Commander-in-Chief of the Polish Army. The Liberator rumbles down the runway and rises into the night sky. Just 16 seconds later, the aircraft plunges into the sea. The pilot miraculously survives, but everyone else on board the plane, including Sikorski himself, is dead. Was it a tragic accident, or was the crash the result of a sinister plot to have the Polish Prime Minister killed? There were a number of people for whom General Sikorski at that time was, if you like, an irritant. The death of Sikorski is surrounded by extraordinary tales of espionage and dark allegations of murder. Wartime Gibraltar was a real hotbed for espionage. But who could have wanted to silence Poland's wartime leader? They were very angry and they blamed Sikorski. Could the pilot have actually been an assassin? And they only recover one person alive, the pilot. Or was it all just a straightforward case of mechanical failure? The only thing that I can really think of that would cause an issue with that is if the control lock stuck. After being granted unique access to the current Polish investigation into the incident, can World War II air crash detective Garth Barnard sift through the evidence to finally discover the truth about Sikorsky's last flight? I think this crash is probably the trickiest crash I've ever had to look into. For more than two decades, Garth Barnard has been investigating World War II RAF air training crashes. But this case is slightly different. The mysterious death of General Sikorsky is of special interest to him. The Liberator crash in Gibraltar, which killed General Sikorsky, has never satisfactorily been explained. There's so much speculation as to the cause of the crash. I just need to find out some more. Lieutenant General Sir Frank Noel Mason McFarlane, the governor of Gibraltar, bids Vladislav Sikorsky, his daughter Zofia Lechniowska, and their entourage farewell. The Polish party is leaving Gibraltar after a short stay there. After traveling from the Middle East, their final destination is London, where the Polish government is in exile. Many historians and many people um, said that Sikorsky was vain, that uh, it was important for him to be famous and to spend uh, time with uh, French and then with uh, British politicians, uh, to take photos with them, and uh, that it was something what was very important for him, that he sometimes concentrated more on this kind of activity, not on uh, politics. As General Sikorsky and his fellow passengers make themselves comfortable for the nighttime flight, in the cockpit, the plane's experienced Czech pilot, Flight Lieutenant Eduard Prowl, and his co pilot, Squadron Leader Kip Herring, are running through their pre flight checks and warming the aircraft's engines for takeoff. He was a very experienced pilot, but he has often, across the years, been accused of, in effect, being the assassin, the person who caused the death, deliberately, of General Sikorsky. The checks take 20 minutes, and Governor McFarlane and his party wait patiently in the cold night air. At last, the Liberator's engines light up, and the heavy bomber begins to rumble down the runway. The Liberator was considered a pretty reliable aircraft in flying terms. It was OK for handling, a bit heavy wasn't fantastically responsive to the controls, according to many pilots. In the darkness, those on the ground can just make out the plane lumbering into the air. It rises for a couple of hundred feet, but then starts to descend. However, the governor is not alarmed. Having flown with Prowl a number of times, 
He's used to the pilot's unusual takeoff technique, which involves climbing steeply and then pushing the nose of the aircraft down to pick up more airspeed before making a second climb to cruising altitude. But this time something has gone wrong. 16 seconds into the flight, Peral pulls back on the controls to begin his main climb, but nothing happens. The controls are jammed. Realizing to his horror that they're about to crash, Prowl screams to his passengers to brace for impact. Moments before hitting the water, Prowl cuts the engines and the aircraft plunges into the sea. Floodlights are switched on and a frantic search for the drowned plane begins. A small dinghy races out of the crash site, but finds only the shocked and injured pilot floating alongside two corpses. They are those of Brigadier J.P. Whiteley, a British Member of Parliament, and Sikorsky himself. In all, 16 people die that night, but five of the bodies, including that of Sikorsky's daughter, are never found. So was this crash an unfortunate accident, or was it an assassination? With so many wild stories concerning the death of General Sikorsky, are we ever going to find out what actually happened? And why are the Polish authorities still investigating this crash 70 years later? Garth needs to find out more about General Sikorsky. Why did he play such an important role in the Polish government during World War II? Garth learns that 62-year-old Sikorsky was Prime Minister of the Polish government who'd been driven into exile in London after the Nazi invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939 and the subsequent Russian invasion 17 days later. A charismatic man, Sikorsky was the figurehead of the Polish struggle against the German and Russian occupations, but relations with his British, American and Soviet allies were not always easy. In July 1941, Sikorsky signed uh, the treaty with the Soviet Union. It is so-called sikorsky maisky uh, Treaty, and uh, it regained uh, political relationships uh, with uh, the Soviet uh, Union and thousands of Polish people were let free by the Soviets but after January 1943 they weren't able to leave the Soviet Union because uh, Stalin started to treat them as the Soviet citizens so it was uh, impossible to, to leave the Soviet state. Churchill and Stalin had agreed to carve up Poland, basically, post the war. And, and therefore, a fly in the ointment, if you like, was, was Sikorsky, because this is not what he wanted. He wanted a free Poland after the Second World War. This is all that he'd fought for. Garth has travelled to Gibraltar to visit the scene of the crash. As he visits the memorial to Sikorsky, Garth begins to consider the theory that Sikorsky was assassinated. He has his starting point, the grim discovery in April 1943 of the graves of 22,000 Polish officers who'd allegedly been murdered by the Russians in 1940. The incident created an enormous diplomatic crisis on the Allied side. Sikorsky demanded a Red Cross investigation into the mass killing of his countrymen. In response, Russia broke off all diplomatic ties with the Poles, while the British government, who were anxious to keep the Russians fully on side, turned a blind eye to it all. Could Sikorsky's angry response to what was called the Kachin massacre have been a reason to have him killed? I suppose it could be said that there were a number of factions at that time for whom it would have been extremely convenient if General Sikorsky was out of the way. And that included uh, the British at that particular time for various reasons, uh, the Poles themselves, some factions within uh, the Polish community, um, the Germans obviously, uh, and also the Russians. So there were a number of people who, for whom General Sikorsky at that time was, if you like, an irritant. Sikorsky heard that numerous soldiers in the Middle East, in the army of General uh, Anders, became his opposition. This army was consisted mainly of soldiers uh, whose homeland was on the eastern part of, uh, of Poland, so they were very anti-Soviet. And uh, when they heard that 
their relatives have no chance to leave the Soviet Union. They were very uh, disappointed. They they were very angry and they blamed Sikorsky and he decided to visit them and to ensure them that everything is uh, going right. And after this visit, uh, he had a short visit in Gibraltar and this accident happened. So there were many who might have had a motive for murdering Sikorsky and Gibraltar may have been an ideal location. Wartime Gibraltar was a real hotbed for espionage, really because of its strategic position. Um, right on the Straits of Gibraltar, it was uh, a very important British base because it controlled access to the Mediterranean. Within days of the accident, the British authorities launched a court of inquiry into the crash. With the pilot adamant that his controls had jammed, the investigation included a number of attempts to retrieve the wreckage from the sea. The authorities even tested another liberator to see if the problems Prowl had described could be replicated. They couldn't. The crash was almost certainly investigated a little more thoroughly than perhaps would have been the case if it had just been any old crew who died in that accident. So the investigation was relatively thorough. The wreckage was recovered from the sea and it was investigated by um, RAF uh, engineering officers who were skilled at looking at this, this type of accident. And, and their conclusion was that there appeared to be absolutely nothing that they could find wrong with the aircraft. The report's findings only seemed to deepen the Sikorsky mystery. It agreed with the pilot's version of events and absolved him of blame for the accident. An official air ministry statement about the Court of Inquiry's findings concluded, the court was unable to determine how the jamming occurred but it reached the conclusion that there was no question of sabotage. To the Polish, the court's findings were unacceptable. They didn't know the cause, but they, how could they rule out sabotage? So immediately you have a discrepancy there. Uh, and it's that discrepancy that the conspiracy theorists, if you like, have clung to, and equally the Poles who were very unwilling to accept the reasons for the crash. Uh, it, it's that particular fact as well that for them was very, very difficult that on the one hand, we don't know the reason for the crash, but we can say that it isn't sabotage. Garth has managed to obtain a copy of the official Court of Inquiry report into Sikorsky's death. He searches through the document for the inconsistencies that so alarmed the Polish government. It's very hard to read this document without bearing in mind all the conspiracy theories that accompany this case. But we'll try to examine this from a purely neutral perspective. Garth starts by examining the court's lines of inquiry. Firstly, it checked for any load and balance issue which may have made the plane uncontrollable in flight, but found there were none, because the plane had flown with almost the exact same weight and distribution the day before without problems. Next, the court examined the aircraft's controls. The pilot always maintained that the controls somehow jammed in flight. His theory being that they remained locked on takeoff. This has happened once before to a Liberator, and that witness stated that the aircraft never made it off the runway. As was common in many aircraft, the Liberator's controls were locked once parked. This prevented damage being caused to the elevators and other control surfaces should there be unexpected windy conditions. A system of metal pins locked the controls in place. The controls are locked with a big strap you can hardly avoid in the cockpit. You can see that here in the Liberator's manual, but the court does investigate this and whether the locking system could be engaged even after the crew had taken the strap off. The investigators state that there was no evidence of damage to the control system, but they specifically asked one witness whether the system could actually be locked in flight. The report asks, if the locking pins had been engaged at the moment of impact, what would you have expected to find? and the witness stated signs of shearing or bending of the locking pins. So it seems they can find no evidence to support the pilot's claim that they, somehow the controls were jammed. So how can they claim that there was no sabotage when they haven't even found a cause for the jamming? Garth has found his first inconsistency in the report, and there are more mysteries. There seems to be a mailbag that was found on the runway. The court themselves find this odd and they can't explain how it fell from the aircraft. Could that have somehow caused the elevator to jam? 
Also, it seems that as a VIP, Sikorsky's aircraft was given a round-the-clock guard, with someone having to sleep in the aircraft through the night. Yet the report criticizes the security surrounding the aircraft. One of the sentries, it seems, was disciplined for failing to stop a member of the RAF from going on board to retrieve some equipment. The report also finds that other official procedures were missed or ignored. There was, for example, no document listing who was on board, and the only copy of the manifest was lost when the plane crashed. Reading this document, you can see why the Polish were not convinced by the court's findings, and also how the conspiracy theories could have started. There was something else. The Russian ambassador to London, Ivan Maisky, stopped off in Gibraltar on the morning of the flight, adding yet more fuel to the fires of conspiracy. Obviously, at this time, there was considerable antagonism between the, the Russians and, and the Poles. So it was all a bit awkward that the Russian ambassador just happened to be transiting through Gibraltar on this particular day. And bizarrely, uh, Sikorsky and his entourage were instructed to, to stay in bed um, until about 11 o'clock that particular, the morning of that particular day in order to keep them out of the way of the sight of the Russian ambassador who was effectively hurried off the, uh, off the rock uh, at, I think, about 11 o'clock in the morning uh, en route to, to the next stage of his journey. Maisky's plane was parked very near to Sikorsky's during his stay. Could the lax security have afforded the opportunity for some kind of Soviet sabotage? And for Garth, the conspiracy theories keep on coming one of which holds that the five missing bodies were never found because they'd never been killed. They'd been abducted by the Soviets. Shukorsky's daughter Sofia was supposed to have been spotted in a Soviet gulag years later. Conspiracy theories never really go away, do they? E even if you find all the answers that should satisfy the conspiracy theorist about that particular conspiracy, there will always be some who just won't accept the evidence that's offered to them uh, or the outcome of any inquiries or findings. By their very nature, conspiracy theories live forever. But of all the people accused of being involved in Sikorsky's supposed murder, it is Flight Lieutenant Edward Pral who has aroused the most suspicion. Garth has found that the Court of Inquiry completely exonerated Pral, And the fact is that he was valued so highly by the RAF that he continued flying VIPs for them for the remainder of the war. So why exactly is he chief suspect? Garth finds that answer partly stems from the question of whether Prowl was wearing a life jacket, known as a Mae West, during the Sikorsky flight. The pilot, like many others, wouldn't tempt fate by wearing their life jacket, so he hung it over the back of his chair whilst in flight. But the report states that one of the witnesses, a Derek Kaltroff, who was in the first dinghy to reach the site, states, we were hailed by someone in the water whom we at once pulled out. He was wearing an inflated May West and was quite conscious, although unable to speak. This was the pilot. Why was he wearing a life jacket? He insisted he never wore a life jacket. Was this the one off the back of his seat? Or did he find one floating around? Or was he expecting the accident to happen? Garth meets with local historian Tito Vallejo. He has studied the crash for many years. What can he add to the investigation? Tito agrees that there are many inconsistencies, but has an explanation for the disappearance of the body of Shukovsky's daughter Sofia and the other four missing victims. Why did they disappear? I can only blame the currents. That, that beach there, it's very treacherous. Uh, I mean, many people have drowned there in the summertime and all that. Uh, and we know that when there are strong currents there, it's very, very dangerous. It happens with ships. A ship sinks in the Mediterranean and it might come out in the, in the Atlantic and vice versa, according to the currents. Amazing, amazing in strong currents. Tito also highlights other details not included in the official Court of Inquiry report. There was another chap who saw the, the, the crash, who was at the uh, siege town or the upper galleries, there was a, an OP there and he was an SOE uh, wireless operator who actually saw the, the crash and he was never asked to testify. And yet, he said that he saw people walking on the wings before the aircraft sank. Not one, but several people 
walking on the wings of the aircraft before the aircraft sank. And now that aircraft sinks, and they only recover one person alive, the pilot. So what does Tito think about the pilot? Does he believe that Peral intended to kill Shukorsky? I don't think anybody would, would unless he was suicidal, try to kill this chap with, with crashing his own plane, you know? I don't think that, that would have gone through his mind. He seems to have been a person that he did what he jolly well liked. He may have not uh, applied regulations as he should, and the thing I base myself mostly on is the question of the life jacket. You're supposed to have it on. Why did he have it off? God knows if he, if he could have been responsible for the accident itself, for not following certain procedures. Because he had such a lot of experience, and you know what happens uh, when they say uh, confidence kills the man, no? So maybe that's what happened. Garth's fascinated by Tito's revelation that another witness saw the crash. He climbs the rock and travels into the siege tunnels to see what kind of view the witness may have had of the accident. Work on the siege tunnels began in 1782, and they were greatly extended during the course of World War II. Amongst the labyrinth of dark corridors, Garth tries to discover where the wireless operator may have been sitting on the night of July 4th, 1943. I'm on the east side of the rocks. From here, I can see the end of the runway, and where the yellow buoy is, that's 150 yards from the end of the runway. The crash itself was 700 yards from the end of the runway, which puts the crash site right in the centre of the arc of view from here. Some reports suggest the aircraft was about 30 feet, Others say up to 150, but later in the 50s, the pilot himself said he was up to 300 feet off the runway. From this position, it'd be very, very difficult to tell the height of the aircraft from this elevation. And also, it was dark, it was at night time. We know that searchlights were focused in on where the crash area was. We also know that a light aircraft dropped flares would have been incredibly dangerous if you consider the amount of fuel that would have been on the surface water. The rescue itself came from the west side of the airstrip, which meant they had to come all the way around to reach them. That launch was about three minutes after the crash itself. We also know from this side that a small dinghy was launched, and that would have been the first point of rescue. The new witness reported seeing people on the wings of the B-24, suggesting it may have not sunk immediately. It took approximately eight minutes for the first small dinghy to reach the crash area. And by the time it arrived, the Liberator had sunk, taking any other survivors with it. But this new evidence does raise the possibility that there was time for Prowl to have instinctively put on his life jacket, even if he could not remember doing so. With the life jacket debate such a major feature of the Sikorsky conspiracy theories, could this new evidence help prove Prowl's innocence? Garth has discovered more evidence that sheds new light on Prahl's role in the crash. It seems that Prahl's unique takeoff technique is at variance with the instructions in the Liberator manual. In the B-24 manual, it advises against pulling up too sharply on takeoff as it will lower the airspeed. And it explicitly states, even if you have to get the airplane into the air at low airspeed, don't lower the nose. If you lower the nose to pick up airspeed, you decrease the lift. The aircraft cannot accelerate fast enough to compensate for this changed angle. Simply put, the aircraft will just drop out of the sky. Did Prowl make the mistake Garth has just described? The plane was not overloaded, but it was very heavy. Could it have been more sluggish than Prowl was used to? Garth has also found some astonishing archive film. The footage is of a 1944 B-24 test stitching into the James River in the United States. It seems that the B-24 had a bad reputation when ditching. For Garth, the footage gives new insight into the Sikorsky crash. If we play the footage, I think we can understand how the pilot survived, but there was no chance for General Sikorsky or his fellow passengers. The archive footage shows the plane skidding across the calm water and then breaking up just behind the cockpit, 
leaving behind a crumpled fuselage. It must be remembered that General Sikorsky's plane hit the water at a far greater angle than this control crash. But you can imagine that General Sikorsky would have been sitting right at the point of that break. It goes to show that the, the plane would have stayed afloat for a limited time, probably enough time for the pilot to have put on his life jacket. But for the others, there was very little chance of getting out, and the reports of multiple people being stood on the wings must be incorrect. Edouard Prahl was an experienced pilot, but could he have made an error that led to disaster? Or was there a technical fault with the plane? Garth has traveled to America to talk to Jim Harley of the Collings Foundation. Jim has been flying Witchcraft, the Foundation's very own B-24, for many years. Can he help answer some of Garth's questions? Jim takes Garth on a flight to explain more about the Liberator. Garth wants to know if the B-24 was a particularly difficult aircraft to fly. As you can see on camera here, I'm always uh, working the controls and uh, always refilming it. And you really can't relax with the airplane. It's always pitching and rolling and doing something with the wind and you're always just correcting for it. It's kind of like driving a really that car is out of alignment, but you have up and down, too. <laughs> and that uh, second model is more difficult with the worst weather? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, any kind of wind or turbulence just adds to the workload of flying. And it's not really that heavy on the control. I can fly with two fingers. Um, but, you know, in having the trim here, the elevator trim, really relieves the workload on pushing and pulling on the yoke. So you can fly with a trim and rudder pedal, really. Really pretty nice. Also keen to find out if the B-24 controls could have become jammed, as Prowl claimed. The only thing that I can really think of that would cause an issue with that is if the control lock stuck or failed or in some way, but even that, it's a pretty reliable system. You know, 70 years ago, those airplanes were brand new and it's really hard to say. In the time I've flown this airplane, we've had one control column bearing failure that wouldn't have any issue with the control services at all. Um, and it is something that's prone to failure, but it would not impede the uh, control surface actuation. So it's really hard to say. Jim takes Garth inside the plane to tell him more about the controls. Can you show me cables that, that control the other one? Yeah, uh, everything's exposed. Uh, you can see them right here, the pulleys and the, and the cables run through, and they're on both sides of the aircraft. Uh, you know, again, they're redundant, so you get two sets. In case one side was shot out, you still have the other. Uh, they run, obviously, right up to the control yoke. It's all Armstrong. There's no hydraulic assist in these airplanes. It's all cables. Is there any way that the elevators could be jammed from inside or outside? Only if they're tampered with. Um, these cables rarely, for, rarely fail. Uh, they're very strong and very taut, and they're redundant. So there's two sets for each control service. So there's really no way that they would fail on their own. Or if they did fail, there's still a backup. Again, unless they were tampered with, I don't see any way that they would, could be uh, disabled. And the outside? The outside of the aircraft, having them uh, uh, damaged in any way is probably pretty unlikely as well unless they're being shot at. They're designed to be damaged and keep working. Uh, they're fabric covered and uh, meant, bullets are meant to pass through them and flak and if flak did hit them, you can still over, overpower it. But while the Liberator was thought to be a dependable machine, Garth has unearthed evidence that suggests the B-24 was perhaps not always reliable. Sikorsky's Liberator was one of a number of Liberators specially adapted for the British. 
His plane was part of a batch delivered two months late because one crashed into the sea at San Diego Bay in America. That crash killed the entire crew. The reason? Its flight controls froze. Same model, same batch. Could the same fault that killed the US crew have brought down Sikorsky's plane? Even at this great distance, in Poland, the controversy surrounding Sikorsky's death has never gone away. And the Polish authorities have never fully accepted the British verdict on the incident. In fact, so determined are they to get at the truth, that in 2008, the Polish Institute of National Remembrance, the IPN, began its own fresh investigation into the crash. The exhaustive investigation has taken six years. And during that time, the bodies of Sikorsky and some of the other victims were exhumed to search for evidence of any foul play. One conspiracy theory claims that Sikorsky was shot or strangled on the plane and that the crash was used to cover up his killing. Garth has come to Poland to see if the question of Sikorsky's murder can be answered once and for all. In Polsce było wiele teorii na temat śmierci generała Sikorskiego. Pojawiało się mnóstwo często bardzo różniących się od siebie, a to miał zginąć w spisku, a to w ogóle miał nie być w samolocie, który był na Gibraltarze. No, pojawiało się mnóstwo hipotez i rolą takiej instytucji, jaką jest Instytut Pamięci Narodowej, jest zbadanie tego wszystkiego tak, aby wyeliminować wszystkie wątpliwości związane z katastrofą na Gibraltarze. Garth meets prosecutor Martin Galambiewicz, who led the investigation. What inconsistencies did he find in the original report? Komisja w istocie nie ustaliła od strony technicznej przyczyn tej katastrofy. Stwierdziła, że przyczyną była blokada, blokada układu sterującego. Przy czym swoje orzeczenie, swoje rozstrzygnięcie w istocie oparła o zeznanie, oświadczenie jedynej osoby, która przeżyła, pierwszego kapitana Eduardo Prchala. Komisja bardzo, uważam, w sposób niewystarczający potraktowała kwestię wypadnięcia worka z pocztą, który został odnaleziony, ujawniony na pasie startowym. What were the main areas of the case that needed further investigation? Nasze śledztwo koncentrowało się wokół trzech zasadniczych wersji śledczych. Mianowicie, pierwsza wersja, że, do, że uczestnicy pokrzywdzeni mogli zostać zabici przed, a samo, sama katastrofa była pewnym upozorowaniem. Druga wersja śledcza, że nastąpiła w przebiegu katastrofy lotniczej w sposób niezawiniony na skutek zdarzenia losowego. I trzecia koncepcja, trzecia wersja, że do katastrofy lotniczej doszło w wyniku zawinionego działania osób trzecich, czyli że w wyniku sabotażu. Wokół tych trzech zasadniczo tez koncentrowaliśmy się. I nasze badania, nasze wyniki w sposób jednoznaczny, kategoryczny, ponad wszelką wątpliwość pozwalają wykluczyć wersję pierwszą, że pokrzywdzeni zostali zamordowani, pozbawieni życia w sposób przestępczy, a sama, sam lot, sama katastrofa miała tylko to upozorować. Tę wersję wykluczyliśmy. The IPN may have ruled out murder, but it's still unpersuaded that the crash was just an accident. Natomiast posiadamy zbyt mało danych obecnie, ażeby w sposób kategoryczny, jednoznaczny wykluczyć ponad wszelką wątpliwość, że Katastrofa nie nastąpiła w wyniku sabotażu. Amazingly, even this high-level investigation can't fully dispel the conspiracy theories. Garth's invited to view some of the highly sensitive data collected by the Polish investigation team. To są te akta, o, którym, o których wcześniej mówiłem. To są materiały z sekcji zwłok generała 
Władysława Sikorskiego. To jest część dokumentacyjna, opisowa. Znajdują się także specjalistyczne już zdjęcia z sekcji zwłok. Antropometryczne również zdjęcia, układ, także dalsze materiały z badań genetycznych, badań i badań toksykologicznych, o, o których mówiliśmy. Przeglądając te materiały, pamiętać, że one zawierają dane delikatne, wrażliwe, dane, które nie powinny być z bliska filmowane. Dla ogólnego obrazu, proszę bardzo. There's certainly a lot of information here and I feel very privileged to have access to this. There's not many people can say that. Amazing detail. You know, there's a lot of uh, man hours gone into this and I just I feel very lucky to be able to, to see this and go through this. And uh, I really need to spend some time um, just to absorb the amount of information that's here. Such is the sensitivity surrounding the case, we're not permitted to show images of the documents in this program. But the autopsy examination of Sikorsky's body found no evidence of strangulation or shooting. For Garth, this is conclusive proof that he was not murdered. And for most mainstream historians, the IPN has merely confirmed what they've always believed. We have no proofs that uh, there were some kind of sabotage. Sikorski was a weak politician, so for the Soviet Union he wasn't an um, outstanding uh, enemy, he wasn't someone uh, who was to be killed. British also haven't had interest in killing Sikorski, he was under their influence and it was a good situation for them. For Germany, Poland wasn't main enemy. Poland was one of numerous countries which Germans occupied, so it wasn't very important who is the head of Polish government. The only force who would benefit after his death was the Polish opposition. But on the other hand, I think that opposition was too weak to organize such an assassination. Tragedy happened, but it was just an accident. Garth has sent all the evidence to noted aviation safety expert Gary Wan, a man with over 30 years of experience, to get his opinions. Gary begins by assessing the claims that the pilot was part of a plot to kill Sikorsky. It's very unlikely the pilot would have crashed the aircraft deliberately in order to kill General Sikorsky. The chances of the pilot surviving would be quite low. And there's also a chance that the person he's trying to kill might survive, so extremely unlikely. If you wanted to destroy the aircraft and kill Sikorsky, then there'd be far better ways of doing it. And one would be putting a bomb on the aircraft. The aircraft would have flown to a height, the bomb would have gone off, the aircraft would have disappeared over the water. There'd be no survivors, there'd be no wreckage. It'd be much more certain, as opposed to the chances of somebody surviving a controlled crash just off the end of the runway. Despite all the controversial theories, Gary is clear on the likely potential causes. In my view, there's two possible causes for the crash. Number one would be the control restrictions reported by the pilot, or secondly, the pilot becoming disorientated after takeoff and inadvertently flying into the sea. Control restriction is something that um, a pilot is presented with very occasionally, and depending on where the aircraft is and how high it is above the ground, it can either be very critical or it can be unimportant. Um, it can be caused by anything, a loose article in the cockpit, a loose article somewhere in the airframe, something interfering with the control runs that's causing a restriction to control input. Often it can be released by pushing the control in the opposite direction, but in some cases that will make it worse rather than better. The possibility of the pilot becoming disoriented after takeoff uh, might be caused by lights on the horizon that aren't actually on the horizon as he sees it. The takeoff technique he used probably wouldn't be the most sensible one to use at night because you've got less visual references, but that was the one he always used. And certainly if he had misjudged where the horizon was, the aircraft may have been descending slightly rather than climbing or even staying level as he thought. By shutting the throttles, that does suggest that the pilot did have a control restriction and it was his last chance to try and slow down the speed of the impact with the water. But Gary has a word of caution for those that dismiss the original Court of Inquiry findings. Certainly the investigation of the control restriction was quite thorough. There was no evidence found of the control restriction, which doesn't mean it didn't happen. 
if there's a witness mark on two particular parts of the aircraft where something's been pinched between pulleys or levers and that makes it quite clear. But in this case, there was nothing found whatsoever. Um, however, doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's not unusual. So that's probably the best suggestion of what did happen in this crash. Some kind of mechanical problem with the Liberator's controls is a strong candidate for the cause of the accident. With modern airliners operating fly-by-wire control systems, whereby the pilot is not physically moving the control surfaces, can the same problems occur today? Once you've gone away from direct mechanical link through control rods, pulleys and wires to these hydraulic and electrical powered flying control units, they are duplicated or triplicated so that you're not going to, as a result of a single failure, end up in a very adverse situation. When you look at an incident like the, um, the Qantas Airbus A380, where due to a completely unexpected type of engine failure, the disintegrating turbine disc cut through a substantial number of aircraft systems, causing multiple failures in areas where you wouldn't have planned. Because of the multiple redundancy and capability of the aeroplane, the crew were still able to assess what to do and how to do it to, to retain full control of the aeroplane and then to bring it into land very successfully without incident and without injury to any of the passengers. Back at home, Garth is still struggling to find the exact cause of the crash, despite the help of the thorough modern investigation by the IPN. I think this crash is probably the trickiest crash I've ever had to look into. And whilst there's reams and reams of data and research into this crash, we're still left with many questions to answer. For Garth, it all boils down to three main possibilities. Pilot error, mechanical failure or sabotage. The pilot wasn't part of a plot to kill General Sikorsky, but it's totally conceivable that a pilot with such a vast amount of experience could still make a small mistake in airspeed and altitude, which would stall the aircraft and lead to a crash, as explained in the Liberator's manual. Could Prowl and his passengers have been the unlucky victims of mechanical gremlins? Although no mechanical problems were found, we know liberators in the past have experienced problems with their controls, such as freezing. So this could quite possibly have been the case. The mailbag was found on the runway, which indicates there were loose items on board and these may have failed the controls, but there was no evidence of this in the wreckage. The last possible cause is the one that is hardest to prove or disprove. I simply don't believe all the conspiracy theories out there. For one, the major powers really didn't have that much to gain by his death. And also, if you wanted to assassinate him, why not put a bomb on board, wait until the aircraft is way out at sea, blow the plane up, no wreckage, no evidence. But there are mysterious coincidences. For example, the lax in security would have given a small opportunity for sabotage. And this was proven by the mailbag that was found on the runway, which shows there would have been access to the aircraft right up to the point in which it took off. I think this is one mystery that will never be solved.